Kaidete o Figori. I'm Fletcher from mindforlanguage.com, and you're listening to Greeking Out, a podcast for ancient and Koine Greek learners full of tools, tips, and possibly tirades on learning Greek using comprehension based methods. If that isn't familiar to you, check out episode zero, The Manifesto, for more info. In this episode, I'm talking with Angela Taylor, who produces the Alpha with Angela YouTube channel. We talk about how she began learning Greek and spend most of the episode talking about Alpha with Angela and what it takes to produce a series like it. Alpha with Angela is a free comprehensible input-based series that assumes little to no prior knowledge of Greek and uses no English in the videos. As such, it's meant to make Greek accessible to anyone regardless of their current languages or background. It's a great series, and I hope you'll enjoy learning more about it in person who produces it. Hi, Angela. It's great to have you on the podcast. Um, thanks for agreeing to do the interview. Hi, Fletcher. Glad to be here. Um, I, I guess I got to know you ultimately through um, Olive with Beth and you starting the Alpha with Angela channel, um, which, you know, for people who are unaware, you're, you're producing videos using comprehensible input-based methods to help teach Greek um, and publishing them on YouTube for anybody who wants to use them. Is that is that correct? That's right, yeah. Yeah, that's 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 a really great resource. And I love how it's it's combining, you know, visual and audio and it's it's free, which is which is wonderful. Um and they yeah. seem to be paced really well and they're you know, as I can tell, it's not really they're not very intimidating. So you can start slow and it and they build. So that's I think that's wonderful. Yeah, my um, my audience is actually um, Bible translation uh, translators, express, especially those that English is not their first language. Oh, and okay. um, since everything is in Greek, it's accessible to them. So anybody from any language background can use them. And so it's important for me to just really pace it very slowly and to make sure that everybody can keep up. Yeah, I, I think that's... I think that's so helpful because, I mean, I, I know um, your model is kind of similar to um, Olive with Beth, but Greek has just got so much morphology that you have to deal with all the time. There's so much complexity, even in basic sentences, that you really have to go slow or you, you overwhelm people, right? Right. Uh, um, there's the reason they say it's Greek to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when I started off uh, with uh, Aleph, you know, I... Andrew and Bethany Case helped me start uh, off with Angela. And we kind of looked at the Hebrew and the way that she started and so on. And it's just not possible to do the same with Greek, just because, you know, even the simplest thing like having three genders just complicates everything. And uh, yeah, so I just have to go at a different pace. Um, and it's taking a little bit longer to cover the base, you know, to, to lay a foundation, but we're getting there. Yeah. Um... I know you're just working, you're about to publish lesson 28. Is that, is that correct? I, I did publish it yesterday, I think. Oh, great. Which would be, which would be your today, I think. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Or the other um, way around. So that's, so that's really cool. So when you started learning Greek, was there anything like what you're doing available or any kind of audio courses um, that, that you were able to use when you were first learning uh, Greek? Um, you know, I didn't even, I don't remember even trying to look if there were, who they were. I, I actually started learning Greek by teaching myself. Um, and I just read the Bible really. <laughs> okay. So um, I tried to do it that way and I realized that that's kind of hard. And then I looked into getting a textbook, I think, and looking into, then I started doing research and I decided that I actually wanted to go somewhere and study Greek and Hebrew. And so, so then I went to Polis in Jerusalem. Okay. And uh, that kept me pretty busy. So there wasn't, <laughs> there wasn't time. Yeah. I didn't look for any other courses at the time. So, okay. So you started off trying to read the new, the new testament i'm assuming um right so you started trying to read that initially and then found that to be 
difficult super and then slow. <laughs> super slow, right? And then a textbook yeah. on your own wasn't enough. So then you sought something, another course. Is that, that what I'm understanding? Yes. So why yeah, and then, mm-hmm. why polis? Um, number of reasons. Uh I was really just praying about what to do next. And um I thought of a friend of mine uh that was a linguist. And um, I contacted her and ironically, she'd been looking around kind of the same thing. I thought either I'm going to do a theology degree to be able to learn Greek and Hebrew or go to a language school. And she recommended Polis. And I used to volunteer at the Home for Bible Translators as well in Jerusalem many years ago. And I contacted them and asked them if they knew anything about Polis and they had good things to say. And And so on, I just, I asked around and I read about the method and I decided that that was the way to go. And then the doors opened for me. So police in Jerusalem and, um, what was the, what was the program like there? Um, um, it was intense for me. I, I mean, coming with absolutely no Greek background, um, my undergraduate degree was in science. And so (laughs) the only Greek that I have is medical science, which, uh, you know, a lot of the medical terms that come from the Greek. So (laughs) that's all I had. And to be able to barely read the, the, um, the alphabet. So it was a bit tough for me in the beginning, quite honestly, especially being in a class where there, most of the students there had some kind of Greek background, either an undergraduate degree or they were teachers. So, um, and it goes fast. Uh, it's not the first time that I've been in a full immersion um, setting. I learned modern Hebrew that way. Okay. And so I kind of knew what to expect, uh, except that it's an ancient language, so you don't really get to speak it outside the class. Um, and so it's a, it's a lot tougher. And the, the pace was quite quite fast for for a complete novice. And so you just have to trust the process <laughs> that you're actually going to get somewhere. I feel like that's trusting the process is is really important when you're trying to mm-hmm. use any sort of methods that are comprehension based because you can't right. you can't measure your progress in the same way where you're oh I've memorized this paradigm or I've you know I, right. I've got a hundred flashcards that I can look at right it's a different you know you kind of just have to trust the process and it it takes time too to you're you're kind of building that mental grammar and your mental model of language slowly. Um, so I feel like that's really important for you know for all of us as as learners is just to relax and say, okay, this does work. We know it works. We have research to show it works, but it our experience doesn't yeah. always feel that we're making lots of progress. Right, and especially when you with a, a group of um, other people that that seem to be much more fluent or learn faster than you or have a background it can be rather intimidating um but uh yeah you you definitely you definitely learn fast when there's that much input when i did hebrew uh, modern hebrew uh hebrew university it was also you know you feel like somebody put a funnel in your mouth and just just pouring stuff in there you know get a chance to chew it so uh but I knew that it's just got to go in and then you need to use it. Mm. And once you start using it, it kind of, things start falling into place. Well, that's, so that's interesting. So then, so you did the polis um, program and I'm, I'm not super familiar with, with that. Um, Is it, how long is it? Um, Are there multiple levels of it? Um, How much did, how Um, much did you do? It's changed. It's changed okay. since um, since I started there. I did a master's degree, so I did two years um, of courses, and okay. then I wrote my thesis. Um, but they now have introduced just like a year, probably more of just Greek, so like a Greek fluency program. Okay. Um, but since I did a master's, I did uh, biblical Hebrew and Koine Greek, and uh, I guess my elective. Uh, most people would have done Latin, <laughs> mm. but I was interested in learning uh, Arabic, so I did Palestinian spoken Arabic instead. <laughs> oh, fascinating! Huh. Yeah, 
because I, I guess I'm more of a practical person. I just wanted to be able to use it rather than, um, like I said, my, my academic background is science and medicine. And um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a, I've done linguistics, but I don't see myself as a linguist or a Greek scholar. Um, I'm more kind of on the practical side, just want to be able to read the Bible and um, yeah, and teach others. Mm. Some of a teacher, I guess. It's it, it's funny you mentioned the medical science background and that being your exposure to Greek. Um, for me, it's the <laughs> opposite. I have medical, you know, I have nurses in my family, and or you know, I'll go to a doctor's office and they'll say they'll throw out some term and I've not necessarily heard it before, but I know the Greek words it's made up of from you know from reading the New Testament or other things, and then yeah. like, oh, okay, I think I know what that must mean. Yeah, when I I um. Before I started this, I taught a group of, of friends and so on Greek, and one of them was a doctor. And yeah, every now and then she'd go, ah, oh, I know what that means. <laughs> so it's kind of fun. Yeah, it is. Um, the, I guess it shows the influence of the language in our, you know, in our culture down through the ages and things. Right. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. Okay. So from, from Polis, uh, where did you go next? What was your next um, stage in, in Greek? Um, well, teaching. Teaching, okay. I, right. I um, I was, um, I had other plans, um, but then COVID hit. <laughs> ah, <laughs> and yes. all that, all those things got canceled. And so I started to just teach. A, 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 I know that teaching is the best way to learn. And so I got a group together and I taught them through the first, the first book of Polis or first and the half of the second one. Um, yeah. So that's what I did for a while, which kind of laid the foundation for me to um, learn to put together a curriculum and teach and prepare classes. Mm. Although that is also, I took a teaching emphasis. I don't know if it's called the same now at Polis, which uh, in which we, learned the method and learned how to prepare classes and and you know create exercises and so on so well wow, that to sounds that. that sounds really helpful especially with the alpha with angela uh channel where you're having to plan and script to do all that right except that um you know it really is different to a full immersion class where you have mm -hmm. direct contact with your students um, which I think is much easier. You get that immediate response. You can see if your students understand, you can kind of adapt. Um, so with my videos, uh, since I, one of the advantages of me struggling through Greek in the beginning was that I remember what it was like. And so I'm trying to, to make it very slow and remember the things I struggled with and try and make those clear. Um, and just imagine what it would be like for, for a student listening. And then you have to be kind of creative, creative in I can't interact with the students. So how else can I, can I get this point across? Hmm. And yeah. And, and like you mentioned with, uh, I think before we started recording that you, you get comments on YouTube, but those are not the same kind of feedback. And um, sometimes it's just people complaining about pronunciation <laughs> systems or whatever, you know, oh, at least once a week. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I always find that funny, but yeah, you know. it's it's usually people who haven't even taken the time to to find out what the project is about. You know who my target audience is, um, and I just tend to, um, unless they're really sincere, I just ignore those kind of comments. Um, you know, it's a, it's kind of a waste of time. <laughs> well, and and the reality is, modern languages have different pronunciations, so. You know, as long as exactly. there's, as long as you and I do not <laughs> exactly. pronounce things the same. You know, from my perspective, as long as it's a, a useful and understandable pronunciation, then what's the problem? Um, it's not like the an ancient Athenian is going to come fuss at us or anything. So, All right, and I also, you know, we wanted to get this project started, and I didn't want to have to learn a whole new pronunciation system um or spend time trying to decide which one uh so it was more and 
more more than that, I needed to learn about um, videography and sound mm -hmm. and um, video editing and you name it. And then also being an introvert, then suddenly being thrust into <laughs> on YouTube, it was very overwhelming. So really to try and th this pronunciation didn't seem that important. Well, it's not that it's not important. It's just that um, for my target audience, the Erasmian um, pronunciation system is is kind of just easier for them. Um, other resources, especially within the, the Bible translation world, are in Erasmian. Um, things are changing, but yeah, it's... And also, I, I can listen to other resources and understand them if they're in a different pronunciation. So I think just as a beginner, maybe it's a bit overwhelming if you're hearing different kinds of uh, pronunciations, if they're very different. But, you know, beyond that, it's it's not really important in understanding, in my opinion. And one of the things I noticed, uh, I've noticed from you know, listening to some of your videos is uh, it seems like you do, you, you preserve vowel length. Uh, phonemic vowel length and things and pronounce the different accents, which to me is really helpful because even if you're, you know, even if you're pronouncing that vowel maybe slightly differently than someone else in a system, it's still preserving you know, features of the words that are useful in, in distinguishing between different grammatical forms and and things. So I think that's really helpful for students. Yeah, it's, it's basically what I learned at Polis. Mm. Uh, and yeah, there's there's some things when when I try and pronounce things, I think mm, might not have been like this because this is really difficult to say. <laughs> uh, you know, and there's kind of a vowel next to a consonant, and I think mm, probably wasn't like that. But uh, the most important thing at the moment is just consistency. So I've got somebody just checking that I'm consistent. Yeah, um, one of my checkers. Well, yeah, that's yeah, that's that's great, and. Again, such useful, such useful material. Um, so, okay, so you taught, you taught through the Polis, one or two of the Polis books. Um, mm -hmm. And so then how did that, what got you interested in doing um, Alpha with Angela? How, how, where did that project come from? Um, it was just basically a need that there was that I guess no one else wanted to do. <laughs> that... Um, uh, yeah, if you'd asked me, it, it's never been my aspiration in life to teach Greek. In fact, if you'd asked me, I would have, I would have thought I would be teaching Hebrew, not Greek. But um, like I said, I had other plans um, that that because of COVID couldn't happen, and then I heard the need that that um, that Bethany and Andrew case of. Aleph with Beth, we're looking for somebody to do something similar in Greek. And mm. so I got to speak with them and um, yeah, we decided that we'd give it a try. And I went over to Mexico to meet them and they helped me get started. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that's history. <laughs> yeah, I think I remember seeing either you in some of their videos or maybe them in some of your earlier videos, which is, was really kind of fun. So they were in mine, yes. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's um, fun to have other people around. My wife and I know Bethany from uh, graduate school um, in linguistics and stuff, and so it's it's really fun seeing, you know, seeing them and seeing how, um, you know, what what they're doing, and then seeing how that spun off into help the ancient Greek world too. So, right. Um, so that's how you and I got acquainted. Yeah, so that's Bethany. how we. Yep, that's how we met. Um. Okay, so that got you into starting to do to do this. So can you um with Alpha with Angela, is that is that something you're able to do? Uh you're not doing that by yourself. You said you had someone check helping you with consistency. Is it what's what's it like producing one of these episodes? Could just, you know, maybe for people interested, what would it in, in a project like this, you know, from from start to finish, what's what does it take to do an episode? I am basically doing it on my own, um, the bulk of the work, but then I have, like I said, I'm not a Greek scholar, so I have others that just check what I'm doing to make sure um, that the Greek is correct, or perhaps just um, 
to make sure that it's comprehensible, makes sense. So I, the whole process starts with me just planning the lessons first. Um, and then I've now got somebody who does work with me actually twice uh, for two hours a week. And um, I'll get somebody like him to, to just read through the script and see if there's anything, I don't know, either really wrong or if they have ideas with uh, the pedagogy. And um, then I have to get props together, ideas of how to get things, uh, <laughs> how to, to make things work. And then I will film, uh, which is a whole entity in its own. Sometimes it goes smoothly, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> I have to redo it. Mm. It's, so I think planning would could take a couple of, a day or two, sometimes longer if we have to change things. And then filming, I don't know, for about a 15 minute lesson could take up to five hours or more. Mm. Um, because I'm on my own, I have to, I'm going to do it a little bit differently to what um, Beth and Andrew do because they work together. I have to be the cameraman and the teacher at the same time. So, um, you know, I want to stop and check that what I've done is correct, that my head's not chopped off or <laughs> my hands out the frame. So um, I'll kind of edit it as I'm going along. And that's mm. why the filming could take an entire day sometimes. And then... Um, and then after it's the editing, which can take a long time, I think the editing can take anything from 20 to 50 hours if we're going back and forth correcting things or trying to find stock footage. Or mm. um, And now that I've got text on the screen, that's really finicky, <laughs> getting yes, the text, sure. and, you know, the timing of it and so on. Um, yeah, and then I've got volunteers who help me with um, got a group that helps me with just checking once, once I put the first draft or whichever draft up just to go through it and check that I haven't made any mistakes. There's always accenting mistakes. No matter how many of us look at it, we'll still find another one. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, once we're kind of happy with what it looks like, um, I'll publish it. And that's, yeah, even publishing it sometimes I'll put it up and then we'll make a mistake, see a mistake or something wrong, take it down. And that that can take hours sometimes, just uploading and ch and changing and putting it back. Um, yeah, and then there's there's resources surrounding that, like vocabulary lists, and I've got um, somebody working on doing a, a grammar lessons that go that accompany mm. the videos. Hopefully that'll be ready one of these days um and then there's writing the scripts and making those available there's there's just a lot of things but that's about as much as i've been able to do on my own so far because there's obviously a lot of other admin as well um that goes alongside it which keeps me busy yeah huh wow yeah i mean that sounds like it's a it's a big process and like you said, you're doing the, the bulk of the work yourself, but you've got a team of people checking and things. So it's you're so these these lessons represent the collaboration of a lot of people. Um correct, yeah. Even if it's only you know, even if a lot of them are maybe only making relatively small contributions, it's still a lot of eyes on it. So that's you know, makes the quality high and you know, people can trust the Definitely. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do it on my own. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just even just having moral support, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I also, sometimes if, if Bethany has time, um, her Greek is kind of at a level that she can watch it and tell me, well, I didn't really, you know, pedagogically also because of what she does and mm. she's really good at it, uh, to just point out, maybe this isn't clear or, um, how about doing that or, um, or well, yeah, I understood what you, what you taught. So that's helpful as well. Yeah. And I know, um, I know at least one or two people that have, I've interviewed on this podcast, I think help out too. Um, seen some names occasionally I recognize. So that's, it, it's neat yeah. to see the, how the Greek community sort of works together to, to help each other. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Like I say, I, it's, it's not my project. It's, you know, I'm just spearheading it. Um, I'd love to for more people to get involved. 
I'd, I'd love to be able to put out the resources faster, but it's just so time consuming. So I'm just curious as you're, as you're planning lessons, like what, where do you get your, um, where do you get your ideas from? Like, what, do you have any resources you're using to kind of help sequence things? Or is that another one of the tasks you have to kind of say, well, I've gotten this far now, what, what should I do next? Yeah, basically, um, I do, you know, Aleph with Beth is a great resource, but, but as we said before, I can't follow the Hebrew. It just doesn't work, right. but it gives me some ideas of, um, of kind of, uh, what to do. Uh, it also saves me a little bit of time with being able to use the same resources, um, mm. like a stock footage and sometimes some of the, the, um, stop motion or other videos or things that, that Beth has used. And since it's all biblical, it's um, really useful. Try and right. save some time. Um, other resources, I do. I do kind of look around. I've got some stories. You know, I bought bought a couple of the books that are written in Greek, like Peter mm -hmm. Rabbit. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I, I try and get a hold of things like that. Um. Yeah, I don't know what else. It's nice so, to see what other people do because it's inspiring. But oh, I see you were asking me about planning. So um, I find, and also Beth had said, we find that you can't plan too far ahead. So you've got kind, mm. kind of like a skeleton of where you want to be. And then um, it doesn't doesn't help try, have, having too much of a detailed plan because as you go, you see, oh, wait, this doesn't work. Or you get another idea and it just goes in a different direction. And so um, I'm only just a couple of lessons ahead with a, a goal to, to get towards. And then obviously a list of, of basic grammar and vocab that you want to cover. That makes sense. Um, and I think I remember reading somewhere in some of my linguistics, you know, is that they sort of think there's sort of a fixed order of acquisition of things to some extent anyway. Um, but then I think pedagogically, it doesn't necessarily make sense to follow that is the other thing I read, read in the research. So it's kind of just you follow what makes, I guess, makes the best sense in the, for the language. And Yeah, there's always limitations to what you, you want to do. I mean, even in a full immersion class, um, ideally, you would want just a few students and um, to have be able to speak together outside the class and so on but sometimes it's just not practical people have lives and yeah. or um most of um these schools you have to have a lot of students in the class to be able to afford to be able to do it and so right it's just from a practical point of view you just have to manipulate and, and see what's what works so. yeah well, that makes sense um so i'm i'm curious uh try to you know, do these podcasts thinking about what would be valuable for people as they're trying to chart their own course through learning Greek. Um, as you were learning, besides, you know, a, an immersion class, um, what resources did you find to be your favorites or most helpful um, as you were kind of coming through, you know, getting, you know, learning Greek from, you know, starting to read the New Testament to police and things like that? Just uh, during my time at police? Or just in general, like what are your what are your favorite resources that you've used to just for your, you know, to improve your own Greek? Okay, well, uh, reading the Bible main thing. Hmm. Um, I I had a goal right in the beginning from even from before I went to Polis to read through the New Testament in Greek, and so I started back then, and it took me two years to get through the the New Testament once. And then the second time I read it, it took me six months. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm going through it again in a year because um, I started going reading the Septuagint as well. Okay. And so, yeah, so my goal this year is to get through the Septuagint. And I think I really think that that's one of the most encouraging resources for me anyway, because I can see how I used to read in the beginning to now I can actually really just sit back and enjoy. Um, yeah reading the text of course some of the books are harder than others but the narrative is really enjoyable yeah that, that's how i feel like 
you, you read the New Testament, you read anything written by John and you're like, oh, this is great. And then you go to Second Corinthians <laughs> and you're like, wait, what? What? Like that, no, I think, Hebrews and... <laughs> I don't, maybe it's because I know he, I knew Hebrews better in English, but I felt like okay. Second Corinthians, which is the hardest, I think it's the hardest of all the Greek in the New Testament that I've ever read. Um, and I guess it just felt maybe the his usual grammar just felt different or something there, but mm. I think yeah. I can't remember the second time I read it, but I remember the first time just going through I think it was Romans and Hebrews stood out to me difficult. But I think it's also because of the concepts are so the sentences are so long and this yeah. to try and if you're not reading fast, to try and get from one end of the from the beginning to the end of the the idea and you've kind of forgotten what it was about by the time you get to the other side. And then the Greek's not easy. I, uh, I remember in college, I had a history professor who um, who stood up on the first day of class and said, here's the textbook. We'll have a quiz halfway through you know, the first half of the semester. There's a midterm and a final. I will not test you on anything I say in class. It's all going to be out of the book. And But he then went on to like spider web and make every like he would connect this thing that we were learning about to everything and how the major flows of history but the man thought in spider webs and i feel like paul does that sometimes when you're reading his greek he's like oh this thing's connected to that so he he drops him in sentence and switches topics on you and you're like wait what <laughs> you're right <laughs> um but and you mentioned reading septuagint and i i think i saw someone on twitter the other day talking about how like you, you read genesis or whatever and you're like oh this is great and then you get to one of the books like bell and the dragon or something that we're not as familiar with and you're like is this the same like i you feel like you then know nothing you've learned no right. Greek. i think that's only coming at the end of the year i've never read um i've never read any of the of those apocrypha so i'm going to be reading it the first time in greek <laughs> yeah that's that's um I've played with Septuagint a little bit. I've, I've started reading bits and, and pieces and I've tried to do some uh, analysis work, but that's one of the things that kind of bugs me about about Greek the Greek world is we don't really have an openly licensed um, Septuagint text yet. Um, okay. Anyway, I've sorry. That, to... I mean, we there's, there's tons of them, but there's no like, there's none that are under like a Creative Commons license like you have for the you know, New Testament and things which is uh kind of frustrating but i know there's people working on it so hopefully we'll see that soon do um, you mean um so so that you can use it to publish yeah. publish okay. or things like that you know because we could we could do all sorts of cool readers you know and resources for people right you know online or otherwise put in your know, reading tools and you know make like right. a lingua latina parte illustrata kind of text but there's no uh, there's no text that doesn't have uh, a copyright on it yet that that's been uh, like well checked you know I know there's mm -hmm. I think first thousand years of Greek has one but I think it's got a lot of errors or something like that so um, anyway yeah. I know people are working on it it's an interesting experience reading it and then reading it next to the Hebrew <laughs> yeah to see how different it is um yeah, and also one of the reasons I'm reading that is because to teach at this level, you want to have a lot of narrative. And yeah. um, the New Testament, quite frankly, has very little just common nouns. <laughs> you know, yeah. a lot of the nouns are, are abstract terms like love and grace and hope. And um, right. and there, there are, okay, the Gospels and maybe Acts. But then when you get to the rest of it, there's very limited um simple context for beginners so i'm going to be using stories from from the old testament yeah and, and even even within the gospels you hit these you hit these sections where there's lots of very technical terms or right. yeah um yeah i think that's i think that's great i feel like septuagint is probably really underutilized in in greek teaching for exactly what you've said you've got these nice long narratives where you you mm -hmm. can read and a the chapter. Greek's not and, that difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And and a lot of people already know the story. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, they, they kind of know where it's going. So their mind doesn't have to struggle to sort out, you know, what's the plot. It's mm -hmm. can enjoy yeah. the language more. So I think that's really helpful. Yeah.
Um, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, that's really uh, cool. So. Yeah, I said the other resources were like stories, and um, I'm grateful for other people who have written s simple stories and made them available um, on, on the internet. So I guess those are the kind of resources I like the most. But mm. then I, I do have some grammar books. I, I learned, I can't say I didn't learn grammar at police because you do, you kind of, you just don't learn it in the traditional way. Right. Um, but it's really makes more sense to me to learn to understand and speak the language and then look at the grammar afterwards. Um, and then you read a grammar book and it's so much easier to understand than the other way around. <laughs> so you've already got the examples like, oh, I know this word. So right. I can understand the sentence. And that's, and that's how we learn our first languages, right? Like we learn to speak them. Mm -hmm. And then in school, they teach, you learn the, the grammar of like, oh, well, that's what that is. Or, you know, so yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. And I feel like for I, myself, I, I learned Greek grammar best as I was reading. Like I'd, I'd be reading through something and say, hey, what is this? And then I go look up the structure and like, oh, that's what this means. Or, okay, that's this paradigm. That makes sense. You know, yeah. and that stuck a lot better than just trying to read a grammar. Uh, yeah, and that's why I think just reading reading Greek every day, especially since that is our goal, is to be able to read the the text, is just um, the best resource, really. Yeah. Um, and like you said, if you you can be aware of which books are more difficult, and the narrative is going to be easier to follow, so you know you, we can do that strategically, even probably mm -hmm. from a you know, still a beginner level, you know, maybe advanced beginner could still get into reading some longer mm -hmm. check chunks if we had the right resources. I'm a terribly slow reader, so even in English. So, you know, it's, it was a, a really a slug for me in the beginning. Um, but so it's, it's really exciting that now I can actually sit and read and enjoy it. It still takes me probably longer than most people, but, um, yeah, I, I enjoy it. So I you think mentioned... that's... No, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that whatever level you are at, and I, I, I was taught this right from the beginning also, is to just read even if you don't understand. Because mm. uh, just the process of, of reading the language and even I think I've always, from the beginning, um, spoken it out as I'm reading so, so that I can practice. Um, yeah greek as well and then also you hear it which is is good for you for learning the language internalizing it yeah no that's yeah because you're you're engaging multiple different senses and it's creating deeper right. you know creating deeper memories and things and and that's that's the goal right to move from working memory into long term so we build up that language model and to practice speaking which i don't unfortunately don't uh have anybody close to me here that I can practice with so <laughs> except my cat but he doesn't answer back <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah that's that's funny um yeah I've, I've definitely yelled things at my cats before in Greek I think um <laughs> we have like six or seven you know outdoor cats because we live in the country and that oh, help wow. keeps they keep snakes and mice out of the, the house and stuff so um yeah hey, Luros. I literally, however you want to say it. Yeah. Um. You, so you mentioned uh, stories and things. Are you familiar with the Greek Learner Text Project? Um. I might be. Tell you. Tell me more. So, so it, it's that... it's um, you know, it's a, it's a collaboration from various people. Um, you know, I think of actually, it's a lot of people from all over now that's working to digitize, um. Greek texts with a, you know, specifically for learners. So like a lot of the 1800s, early 1900s oh, right. public domain, you know, mm. um, sort of short story sets and things like, I think Chambers, Greek War of Independence and, you know, selections from some of the classical texts and stuff. But there's um, Rouse or Rouse's A Greek Boy at Home. That's, mm -hmm. that's one. There's been a lot of things. Um, and so they're trying, you're trying to digitize and publish, um, publish those online with Creative Commons open licensing, so people can use them and remix them to make other resources and things. Okay, that's great. Um, anyway, I think it's greeklearnertext.org if you're interested. Yeah, I'll have a look. I might even have a 
had a look already. You know, I there are some resources resources that I use like that, or I'll go and look at them. But I, to be able to, I, if I don't get lessons out at a certain speed, I really get moaned at by <laughs> my best <laughs> subscribers. Uh, I kind of focus on on uh, yeah, and learning Greek, and I have. I have some of my volunteers who I kind of outsource things like that to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Try and find things that are relevant. That makes sense. <laughs> so, so what's the, so you're at lesson 28 now. 28. Mm -hmm. Is there a, is there a long-term plan for Alpha with Angela in terms of how many lessons you're trying to put out? Or is it just, we're going to keep going and see how far we get mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and could you use more yeah. people? What if if people wanted to help? It. How could people get involved with your project? I always need help. Um, unfortunately, it's often in in the the things that are not so exciting to do. <laughs> and um, but uh, there's always a place for help. Uh, I have pretty good team that check my lessons. But you know, if if there are people that have very good Greek that are advanced Greek um, experts, I don't know who if they feel like they want to help me. Always, always happy to have more help because everybody's busy and it's always on a voluntary basis. And so sometimes that's a hiccup. I have to wait until people have time to check things, and that also mm. can make things take longer. Um, but. Um, yeah, I'm hoping to one day get like a volunteer um, coordinator who can kind of take over the the, the admin of keeping up with people and um, just follow follow up because I find it very difficult to do that and keep up with all the emails and correspondence and um, things that are that are a little bit outside of what I need to focus on. Um, that may not have been too helpful i know that on on my site um free greek there is a page there for volunteers and you can kind of read up there on the kind of kind of things that one can help with okay so it, it sounds like just you mentioned the volunteer thing so if somebody is like excited about the project and even if their greek is not the best they might get help with some of the admin activities that would give you more time to help create absolutely. lessons absolutely like if um, I've got somebody now that is opened an Instagram page for me, I absolutely do not want to <laughs> have more admin like that to do. It just, you know, it just distracts me and then the lessons take longer. So, um, yeah, she opened a page, but, we'd, you know, it'd be nice to have something like that, um, similar to what Aleph with Beth has. And they'd need to have some Greek to be able to do that. Right. But I mean, I can check what they've done. Um, there's that kind of thing. But I guess in the beginning, I need people more to um, to be able to help me to get the project moving forward faster. Mm. And but yeah, the, there's so many little different things. It's, it's, it just depends on how, what they are willing to do. So it sounds like unless someone's going to be able to come to South Africa and physically, you know, live close by and help you film things, you you know, maybe lesson planning and some of the, you know, checking and things like that would be, or things people can do from a, from a distance if they wanted to be involved. Right. Lesson planning. Um, it can be a bit tricky having too many people involved. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, Cause then I have to email back and forth and it really, there's Duke. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, yeah, then I end up spending a lot of time just emailing back and forth about and trying to explain people to people why I'm doing it like this. And mm. um, so that can get a bit complicated. So keeping that group small uh, is better. Um, but there's also like things like vocabulary lists and scripts and putting pictures on the script and, um, mm. you know, checking things, translating, uh, translating the YouTube channel into different languages. Um, there's, there's a lot of things to do. People that are geeky, <laughs> people that are, um, 
oh, sorry, no, my cat just walked past and distracted me, so I can't remember what I was saying. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, translating things into their language. And I was going to say something else. I don't know. Creating artwork. Um, hmm. Yeah, I would love to be able to um, make like video clips. Uh, in a, I don't know if AI, if there's any free AI or something that can make uh, little stories of, of um, drawings, animations. That's what I'm looking for. People that know how to animate, that would also be great. Okay. Well, those are not my skill set, um, unfortunately, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure there are people listening who who have those. So, um, and also people that do know Greek, we want stories, you know, that can kind of um, using the vocabulary that we they've already that the students have already learned. Mm. That would be nice little short stories, and we could add some more stories. Um, for practice in amongst the lessons. Yeah, and and you've already got the vocabulary list, or or you have people working on those vocab lists, so that I do, wouldn't be, yes. you know, that wouldn't necessarily be all that difficult. Um, to sequence, you know, to know what kind of words to include and things like that. So yes, yeah, that's the, pretty cool. The vocabulary list is is available, and we we try and make it um, the the words that or the form of the word that is is being taught um not only the lemma so mm. so you would know it, which of the um declensions or inflections or whatever that that word that the students have learned from that word right and that you makes know what sense I mean? i'm not mm -hmm. right because you know i think if I remember early on when you're learning a language, like you learn each word form as a separate vocabulary item until the right. mental grammars realize that all these things are the same and can discern the patterns. So that makes a lot of sense right, too. Yeah. yeah. Some people are concerned about me not teaching the paradigms, but um, it's not that I won't. I just want to talk, teach all those forms in, well, Maybe not all of them, but the, the most frequently used ones in the New Testament um, before I put it together in a table, you know. Right. So once it's in the table, you actually know those words and you've seen them in context. And then you can see the pattern. Yeah, and like you said, you already have the examples in your head at that point. So it's much easier mm -hmm. to consolidate information, you know, and, and you already know rather than trying to internalize vocabulary and patterns and things all at the same time. Although I do give it in little bite chunks, you know, kind of hinted, oh, this is the pattern. So so that it's not too much grammar, but that by the time we get there, they'll be familiar with the patterns. Yeah, that makes sense. One thing I've I've thought um about is is discussing Greek grammar in Greek. Um mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting. We have you know Greek grammars from the Koine period, you know, after the New Testament, but you know, like Dionysius Thrax and some of these others so we kind of know how how they would have talked about their own language um and well, you know that's that's a fairly limited set of, of vocabulary that you know these grammar terms are there's not that many of them but then you could you know you can build a lot of sentences and things talking about it but again this is just a ideas that float in my head and probably would be almost useless for what you're doing but well, that is how we were, since it we learned in full immersion at Polis, um, we did talk about the grammar, and it's, we talked about the grammar in Greek, and we were taught the, the Greek terms for all of that. And so sometimes, uh, you know, <laughs> because that's how I learned it, the terms in English don't come to me so fast. And um, yeah, it's uh, I, I have used one or two of them in the lessons, and I'm contemplating using them in the future, but um, by the later stage, probably but I will be using them. Well, that's really cool. Um, mm. I think that's, like I said, I, I think that's a, a neat way to be able to, just another way to be able to talk about the things in the text, you know, people can use as a, you know, just to, to, as they're studying to talk about what they're reading in, in Greek and, you know, it's another way to keep using it. So. Yes. Um, well, cool. So um, 
I guess as we as we wrap up, um, so where can people find you if they wanted to get involved or you know learn more about the project? You you mentioned a website, um, free Greek dot. Right. I, I forget the rest of it. It's <laughs> www.freegreek.online. Online. Okay. Um, but you can go if you go to Alpha with Angela um, on YouTube. In every lesson, there's a link to the website and to other resources, so I can find it through there. And then I think my email address is there. Um, and people can contact me that way. And and correct me if I'm wrong, did I did I see on one of the lessons that you also published the audio separately? Yes, I have some wonderful volunteers who do that for me that I don't even have to think about it. So they they strip the the audio and they put it on Spotify and um, it's another podcast. Okay. So, so it's available. Yeah. So in theory, someone could watch your lesson and then go, you know, as they're driving, when you don't want to watch a YouTube video, they could listen to it or jogging or and whatever, practice. listen to the audio right. to review. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I have, a, I have a lot of, uh, sorry, volunteers who have done various things that's, you know, here and there, which I haven't mentioned, but there's always little things like that. People, are, they took the initiative and said, look, we're doing this for, I live with Beth, can we do it for you? And it's great if somebody can do something like that 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 I don't have to worry about. It's great. <laughs> yeah, it takes the admin off me, and I can focus on the lessons. Well, very cool. Um, yeah. So, Angela, thank you for sh sharing your story um, and and telling us, giving us behind the scenes for um, the you know the the project you're working on and how people can get involved. Um, and I'm really excited to see it continue to grow. Um, I think it's a real help to both beginners and people who have learned Greek but want to try to use Greek in an active way and kind of get get to talking and listening and things. So it's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, oh, it's my pleasure, and uh, it's also encouraging to hear having comments from all over the world from people who are using um, my lessons and are enjoying them. And uh, yeah, so keep keep interacting. And yeah, just thank you for everybody that is helping me to make this happen. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. Maybe we'll uh, have to talk again at some point in the future about getting an update on how the project's going. Great. Thanks. My pleasure. Intro and outro music is Funky Thanksgiving by Admiral Bob, used with gratitude under a Creative Commons 3.0 attribution license. The track can be found at dig.ccmixer.org.